Oh, yeah. Welcome to another podcast. Thanks for joining me. My name is Cameron Buckner, and this is the Dixie Cryptid Podcast. We've got two stories, and then we've got something different at the end. The last 20 minutes of this podcast is something I have never done, and it is launching a project that I'm really interested in, a project that actually fascinates me. It's kind of an investigation Huh, I don't I don't know what you would call it, but there is a phenomenon in the Bigfoot world and I am determined to get to the truth and figure out what is going on at the BFRO. May we can stir up some shite. I don't know. That's not the point of it, but I know it's gonna happen. I know it's gonna happen. And a little bit of controversy doesn't hurt anything every once in a while. It gets people thinking and it gets people talking about a subject and wherever it goes is fine with me. I don't care where it goes, but I wanna find out what the BFRO is actually about. First, we've got two stories and then we're gonna launch this discussion on the BFRO. You just have to listen to it to get my point of view, but let's jump to it. I'm ready to roll with it. All right, here we go. Here's an email from JW. Here's what he writes. There was a road we used to drive into the Brackish Swamp in eastern Harris County, east of Houston, Texas. And in the daylight, it wasn't the least bit scary. In fact, it was beautiful. Oak trees draped in Spanish moss and tall grass and flowers were everywhere we looked. But at night, it was a different story. Those big oak trees closed in and turned the world to pitch. As the saying goes, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. We like to find people who had never been on that road and then take them down it at night. There was a steep drop, and just before we'd get to the bottom, we'd turn off the headlights and scare the hell out of them. We did it many times, never failing to scare the living crap out of teenage girls, and never once having a problem. One night, my friend Charles decided to take our friend Jesse down there and scare him. Charles was a few years older than me. He'd gone to school with my brother, but when they graduated, my brother joined the Navy. Back then, volunteering for the military meant you had a choice. If you waited to be drafted, you were usually sent straight to Vietnam. That night, we were in Charles' truck and heading down the road. It was a two-lane blacktop called Wallaceville Road that no one lived on. Charles was driving his F-100 at 55 miles an hour, and Jesse was already a little freaked out by the speed we were going on that road. Right at the drop, Charles cut the lights, and Jesse started screaming for him to turn them back on. I was laughing inside and doing my best not to do so out loud. And then Charles turned the lights back on, and boom, we hit something. It happened so fast that we never saw what it was. It was just a blur. Charles slammed on the brakes, and whatever it was went up into the hood and over the top of the truck. And we sat there for a minute staring at the road, and we were all pretty shaken up. What did we hit? Jesse asked. His voice was trembling. We were all looking at each other, but no one answered. Finally, Charles opened his door and he got out. I exited the passenger side, but Jesse stayed in the truck. We walked to the front to survey the damage. There was a big dent in the bumper, and there was blood and hair. Scratch marks traced a path across the hood along with more hair and blood. I could feel the silence closing in on us. At first, I didn't know if it was my own shock or if everything had actually gone quiet. I focused on the only sound I could hear. That was the truck's engine, running. Charles pulled a flashlight out from behind a seat and walked to the back of the truck and then further up the road a few yards. He didn't see anything, so we got back in and we backed up to where we thought we'd hit whatever this was. Charles positioned the truck to angle the headlights into the woods. We still didn't see anything, so we got out. But not Jesse, though. He wouldn't get out. He begged us not to, either. 
We could still hear Jesse as we walked down what looked like a narrow path. We'd made it 15 yards past the reach of the headlight when the horn started honking repeatedly. With a quick glance at each other, we took off at a dead run back up to the truck. Jesse was inside and he was covered in sweat and shaking uncontrollably with all the windows rolled up. I grabbed the door handle, but it was locked. Charles found the door was locked too. We pounded on the windows and we demanded that Jesse let us in, but he wouldn't, or he couldn't, respond. It was several minutes before he regained control of his senses and unlocked the doors. We tried to get him to tell us what happened, but he just sat there shaking and sweating. We decided it was better to get out of there, so we left as fast as we could. We drove back toward the highway and lights, but Jesse never uttered a word. We dropped him at his house on North Shore, but again, he never spoke. He climbed out of the truck, and he walked slowly to the front door with his arms down at his side like some sort of funeral march. We watched him go inside before heading to my house, where Charles dropped me off. I didn't go in right away. I sat outside and thought over what had happened, and a million questions were going through my mind. What had we hit? And what did Jesse see that shook him up so badly? And why wouldn't he talk to us? The next morning, I called Jesse, but he still wasn't talking. I had to walk the two miles to Charles' apartment because he didn't have a phone. His truck was sitting out front, and I stopped to look it over. There were three deep scratches about one inch apart and five inches long on the hood. Well, I knocked on the door, and Charles came out to look at the damage with me. We decided to go over to Jesse's and talk to him, but his mother met us at the door. She was furious. What did you do to Jesse last night, she demanded. He wouldn't tell her. He wouldn't tell anybody. He wouldn't even come out of his room. I was 13 when that happened. Jesse was 16 and Charles was 18. It was almost two years before Jesse spoke to me again. And when he finally did... All I ever got out of him was that something came out of the woods after Charles and I went down the path. It started shaking the truck, he said, and he closed his eyes and he couldn't bring himself to open them again. He blindly groped for the horn, and when he found it, he just kept honking it, and then the shaking stopped when we came back. That was the first time something weird ever happened to me. There was a second incident that happened four years later while I was fishing near the San Jacinto River in East Harris County, Texas, but I won't tell you that story now. I lost touch with those boys over the years, and I wonder if either of them is still around. I'm 62 years old now, and this is the first time I've spoken about this. Maybe I blocked it out somehow. And that's the end of his email. <laughs> that You know, I, I don't know. Some of that story kind of makes me laugh. And some of that story makes me uh, just terribly feel sorry for Jesse. But these guys were just riding around playing tricks on each other. You know, that happened to me one time. And actually, my dad did that to me. We were going down a dark road on our way to his cabin. And he just reached up and turned the lights out. And I was like, holy crap. I, I I thought I had blacked out or something. It was so dark. But I know that's a funny thing to do to people. Just, you know, you can't hardly do it now with these new trucks and new cars. The lights are like automatic. But something came back after this truck. Apparently it was whatever they hit and it was shaking the truck. Who knows what it was, but can you imagine how scared you would be if you were in that truck and something was standing beside it shaking it as if it was trying to get in? That would scare me to death. JW, I really appreciate you sending this story. It was great. It was different. It was a different type of encounter story, and I think it was fantastic. So thank you, sir, for sending this. All of this has really been blocked out until recently. I've heard so many stories and started putting two and two together. I didn't know what it was that I saw until recently, and some things leading up to it and things that happen afterward have put it all in perspective. My name is John, and I'm a firefighter and a minister of the gospel. What happened to me happened when I was 12 years old, 
That was back in 1987. I lived in a neighborhood in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. The neighborhood was not huge, but not small either. However, every bit of it was surrounded by woods. There were also bayous not too far away that we would sneak away and fish in, and we knew most of the woods around there like the back of our hands. We had BB gun wars and pine cone wars and bottle rocket wars, and we camped out and we built forts, and you get the picture. We loved the woods, and we played and we played hard, except there was this one section of woods when you first entered the neighborhood that we just never felt comfortable in. We call those woods the creepy woods. When you entered the neighborhood, they were on the left-hand side. I remember my friend's dad took us back there mudding in the back of his pickup truck, and they seemed like they went on forever. In reality, I believe if you followed them far enough, it would drop into a huge subdivision several miles away. We could never put our finger on it. We just didn't like going back there. Again, it was just creepy. Thinking back, there was a gravel road that us kids used to take to the old country store a couple of miles away. We were able to avoid the busy main road to get there. That gravel road covered a section of those creepy woods. It was just close enough to the main road where you could hear the traffic so it didn't seem quite as creepy. My dad used to send me to that old country store to get his newspaper every Saturday and Sunday morning. I would guess that walk was between one and two miles. There were so many times that I would take that walk and feel like I was being watched, and I would stop walking and I would listen because even though I was walking on the gravel, I swore I could hear leaves crunching like something was keeping pace with me. Many times I was with my friends and we would all get the same sensation. Somebody would tell everyone to stop and be quiet and we would just listen. It was eerie, but we almost always chalked it up to us being scared of the creepy woods. One night my dad was driving me home from a little league baseball game He was president of the league, so we almost always got home late. As he took a right into our neighborhood, the creepy woods were on the left. We went in a 100 yards and then took another right. There was a field that we played baseball and football on right across from those woods. As he took that right, our headlights shined into the field, and that's when we saw it. The lights caught glowing amber-colored eyes and a shadow of something that was absolutely huge. We both saw it for a split second and we passed it. It was so quick that neither of us could get any great detail. Dad let out a, what the heck was that, and slammed on the brakes and he threw the truck in reverse. And then it was gone. We sat there for a minute or two and discussed what we had thought we'd seen. After a short discussion, we determined that we both saw it, so we knew we were not making it up. We told my mom and sister when we got home, and they thought we were trying to scare them. Well, we went out the next day, and we walked around the field where we saw it, and there was a lone pine tree on that end of the field, 25 feet from where we had seen the shadow. At a best guess, we determined this creature was at least 8 feet tall. Now, I remember the ground was dry, so we never found any tracks. And over the next week, we had to quit talking about it, and we got back to our daily routine. A few weeks later, I remember this, it was the same summer because we moved away shortly after. My buddy and I were walking to his house. It was just after dark, and we were going to see if we could stay the night. We had to walk by the field my dad and I saw this creature in, And honestly, I hadn't thought much more about it. But as we walked by, I got another uneasy feeling that we were being watched. I did the best I could to ignore it. I didn't mention anything to him because I didn't want him to think I was crazy or scared. We got to his house and his parents would not let us stay the night, so I was stuck walking back home by myself. As I once again approached the field, this time it was on my right, There were two ways that I could go home. I could either cut through the woods to the left, which shortened up my trip quite a bit, or I could go straight and take the road, which added several minutes. I was going to take the woods. I'd done it a hundred times, 
and as I was about to take the turn into the woods, the hair on the back of my neck stood straight up. My heart started racing, and I literally became fearful. Something on the inside of me screamed, Do not go that way. And I listened to that voice, and I took off running as fast as I could down the gravel road. I ran all the way home with tears streaming down my face, and I never looked back. I think I broke a world record that night. I opened the door and went straight to my room, and I never discussed it with anyone. I've never had that kind of fear come over me before, and I've never had it since. But after listening to so many encounters, there's no doubt in my mind what was out there. Again, I never talked to any of my friends about it, and only recently, I'm 44 years old now, did I ask my dad if he remembered that huge creature we saw in the field that night. He had not thought about it until I mentioned it, he said, and I told him what I thought it was, and he didn't disagree with me. That is what I believe to be my encounter. It may not be as exciting as some that I've heard, but I will always remember the fear that I felt that lone night. I will always remember those amber-colored eyes and that dark shadow that stood in the field. God bless you, and thank you for taking the time to read my story. (laughs) Uh, I just love it when people thank me. It's just so nice. And he signs off sincerely, John. John's a firefighter. John, stay safe, brother. You know, kids have these experiences. I probably had something like this where there, there weren't many woods around my house, but there were a few. And at night, I don't know, when we were kids, the night seemed so dark. Now, I walk out in the woods at night, I don't think anything about it. But when I was a kid, it was spooky. It was pretty spooky. And what's the first thing you do when you're in a position where you're spooked as a kid? You run like crazy. And that's what I would do. I would tear through the woods, through the trails, pop out under a street light, and then I would tear all the way home. And (laughs) that's just what kids do. But I have no doubt what you encountered that night. And um, the last couple of podcasts I've done, I've talked about It may seem like I'm discounting feelings. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, be a critical thinker and think this through. Think it through. And don't let these things change. Don't let one event or one feeling change your life forever. Stay out in those woods and have a good time. There's no reason to be afraid of the woods. And I I know I say this all the time. But I really care that people get out and enjoy that stuff. So that was on my mind. I thought I'd say it. All right, let's go to another one. Okay, this is going to be a little different. I um, I think this is recording. I've got a new little recorder <clears throat> that you can clip a mic on your shirt or your seat belt or whatever. And the reason I bought it was because, and I'm driving right now, it's because sometimes when I'm out on the road, I have these thoughts and ideas pop in my head. And I'd, I'm always, uh, I forget it by the time I get back to my office to record it and so I bought this little recorder we'll see how this works but here's the reason I'm doing this I just got an email from a man out west and he's responding to some comments I made about the BFRO in my last podcast and what I was saying in that podcast by the way I'm looking for a place to pull over here so I can read his email but Uh, What I said in that podcast is I don't know anything about the BFRO, uh, but all I ever hear about the BFRO are horrible things, just negative things. I don't think I've ever seen a good comment in the comment section or in an email or anywhere of anybody saying anything positive about the BFRO. And that's pretty strange to me because they're a huge organization. Well, not knowing anything about them, I don't know if they're a huge organization or not. They may just have some real good tech people who do really well with keeping up with a website and posting the encounters that they post on the BFRO website, which is a huge wealth of information, by the way. And uh, it's the same thing I said the other day in, in my podcast. Sorry I sound distracted here. I'm trying to get through traffic, get to a parking spot. All right, I'm going to pull over here, and I'm going to read this email, and then uh, 
the other day it was funny because uh i I copied a bunch of comments that I got on the BFRO. Matter of fact, I may read those first. I printed them out and I've got them right here. I'm sitting here holding this remote like I need to hold it, but I don't. I'm going to set it down. I'm just going to read a few comments that I got on that video. And this is going to kind of show you. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, the point is not to give out names or the people who made these comments. The point is, this is an interesting phenomenon to me. Uh, not being interested in Bigfoot really myself, but everything that surrounds it is fascinating to me. The people who research it, the people who are interested in it, the people who write about it, that's what fascinates me. And these comments kind of go along with that. So I'm going to read a few of these. Here's the first one. A BFRO, I've heard so many people who contacted them and have their stories changed or never listed like this man said. And I have little respect for people who will change your story to fit their narrative. I feel sorry for people who trust them and then have their words turned. That's not the way to do business to me, so I would never call them. So I'm wondering <clears throat> where this person heard this. Uh, uh, and I, I, I have a suspicion that all of these comments are based on something some YouTuber said about the BFRO. I don't know who it is, but I've I've seen uh, years ago when I watched Bigfoot videos, I heard it, uh, people talk about it. Here's another one. I agree, Cam, too many stories and who could investigate them all. Uh, good job, you're a good reader. Okay, so that's kind of in favor of there's too many stories, who could read them all? And they're talking about the BFRO thing. Here's another one. Don't trust the BFRO. Several incidents where they have reported Bigfoot in an area to government officials and SWAT soldiers later came and hunted and killed the Bigfoot. Really? Really? I wonder where this person got that information. People are always wanting me to vet my stories. I wonder if, he, if this person vetted that story or did they just hear some YouTuber say it? Here's, uh, uh, I've got so many, uh, I'm not going to do them all. Okay, here's one. What I heard, <laughs> remember, this is always, this is always funny to me because the comment starts with what I've heard was that the BFRO had changed details in reports along with the founder flying over top people's property that wouldn't allow the arrogant founder and organization on their property and the large amount of money charged for expeditions allegedly but i believe there is a valuable amount of data in the bfro archive so there's a little something positive there here's another one the bfr the bfro is known to be run by a major douchebag and the people there will stomp all over your land without even asking permission according to someone he names a channel here not the point here is not to name channels but douchebag really do you do you know this person do you know that he's a douchebag uh here's another one i've heard many things about that group if enough people have had bad experiences with that group there must be something to it just like the many people sharing their sasquatch experiences everyone can't be lying about them meaning the bfro here, here's, uh, let's see, uh, oh man, I've got, oh God, I've got three pages of these. Here's one that says a, uh, uh, they give the name of the channel, but I won't say it because that's not the point of this. It's just uh, uh, a specific YouTube channel says that they get information about encounters and then notify government authorities that want to capture them or wipe them out in family groups. If they were a true research group, they wouldn't have blown off that guy's story and refused his calls. They're talking about the man in the story, the smoke jumper, I think is who uh, tried to call the BFRO and they, the, he claims they ignored him. And then here's one that says it depends on the investigator with the BFRO, but they will go out into the field literally. And then here's one that says, geez, I would never tell the BFRO anything. Really? Why? I'm just curious about that. Oh, here's one. I'm not too familiar with the BFRO myself, 
But from what I understand, they like to pick and choose who they'd like to believe while showcasing an arrogant attitude towards certain people who don't know too much about the subject and are seeking help only to be ridiculed as if they were speaking to a skeptical friend about it. I've also heard that they like to embellish some of the stories or even leave pertinent information out of the story and insert their own interpretation of events. I don't think it's their goal to reveal Sasquatch, rather they seem to add to the chaos and confusion without realizing that some folks are actually traumatized by their experience because they weren't educated on the subject. Okay, there's another one. That's a long descriptive criticism of the BFRO that this person heard. Who did you hear that from? I'm just curious. Uh, here's another one. Heard that men in black types eradicate any Sasquatches in the areas people report them to the BFRO. So it's best not to report anything to that alphabet agency. Here's another one. Don't trust the BFRO. The founder, Matt Moneymaker's father, worked for the government. People think Matt reports sightings to the government as well because I've heard from multiple people in the comments... <laughs> He's getting all his information from the comment section of a YouTube channel. Talking about a day or two after reporting a sighting, they start seeing helicopters and black SUVs when they never seen anyone there before. So there's another one. This guy's getting all his information on the BFRO from YouTubers and the comment section. Uh, and it just goes on and on. And there was one positive one. I'll read it. It's probably the only fully positive well yeah it's probably the only fully positive comment i've ever seen on the bfro uh, the bfro has one very positive contribution to the bigfoot encounters across the country their database is simply outstanding and it goes back 50 plus years state county and encounters from all over the u.s and canada they're recorded and categorized by their severity Matt Moneymaker, founder of the BFRO, is aptly named. Or, uh, is aptly named. His production company, Snake Oil Production, doesn't help its reputation at all. So that's not a negative comment. He just doesn't like the name of the uh, the man's production company. And I don't. <clears throat> now here again, I don't know if any of this is true, but this has become a phenomenon that I've wondered about for the three years that I've been doing this podcast. Okay, let me find this email this gentleman sent me. And he gave me permission to read this email. But he uh, he says to go ahead and use his name, but I'm not going to. But I'm going to read this whole email. And I want you to listen to this email from a BFRO investigator. And then contrast and compare what he says to what you just heard in the comment section that everybody hears on YouTube. Every, you know, that's, that's how they base their judgment on the BFRO. He writes, I'm a retired detective sergeant from a North Idaho Sheriff's office, and I'm a Bigfoot enthusiast. I was in law enforcement for 25 years with the last 15 years as a detective. I worked homicides, death investigations, and sex crimes. I supervised the sex crimes unit the last three years of my career. I cite my background not to try to impress you, but to let you know that I have an extensive background of interviewing people. And I believe because of this, I find the witness accounts the most fascinating. They will never prove anything, but the sheer volume and similarities of described behavior is so consistent over the decades, it has convinced me that at the least we have a really, really big mystery on our hands. It reminds me of the Napoleon saying, quantity has a quality of its own. And in referring to my latest podcast where I talked about the BFRO, uh, not in support or not in non-support, all I said was, don't form an opinion based on what people on YouTube say. That was my whole point. But he says, I appreciate your recent comments on the BFRO having a bad rap. I'm an investigator for the BFRO for Idaho, and I kind of suck at my free job, but I hope to be better. To explain, 
I heard Matt Moneymaker on a podcast comment on how Idaho was so underreported in Bigfoot sightings because there was no investigators to follow up on all the reports. Well, I thought to myself, well, I'm into Bigfoot and I investigate things, so why not reach out? And so I did. And Matt waived some of the requirements needed to vet these reports before they are published. And I discovered hundreds of reports that have never been followed up on going back 20 years. So I appreciate your attitude of not immediately trashing a group because some witness feels slighted by the BFRO. Is the BFRO a government cabal with all sorts of secrets? It seems highly doubtful, but I just do my thing in Idaho. I only know a few other investigators, and there is really no agenda that I'm aware of. You contact the witness and you flesh out the encounter. You go to the scene if it is fresh, and you use your best judgment, and you edit their report only for readability issues if warranted. Let's see, I lost my place here. And then you add your own notes and you submit it for publication. I have discovered some of these witnesses become a little clingy and they get kind of weird, but that is to be expected, I guess. I can also say that I've spent several hours talking to Moneymaker on the phone. And whatever you think of him, that dude lives and breathes Bigfoot. The reason for my extensive talks was because I was in charge of my agency's drone program and I'm a drone pilot. Matt is extremely interested in drone technology for Bigfoot research. I only say this because I'm a small town guy and I'm immediately suspicious of Hollywood TV people types. So I was pleased to find out that the folks on Finding Bigfoot are real life Bigfooters and not Hollywood fakes. And he goes on to talk about <clears throat> some other things that really aren't important. But that, that is quite the contrast from the comments that I just read to you guys. And it's, I, th I think there's something here. And so, you know, we live in a world where people just want to be told things and they want to be, uh, they want to follow somebody. They want to, maybe in some circumstances, it is tell me what I should think about this situation and then I have a position on it and then I can move on. You know, I've done that before. I've done that with things before. Uh, n most of the time to find out that I'm wrong once I start reading up on the subject. But this has gotten me so interested in this BFRO phenomenon. And this is the first email I've ever gotten from anyone, anyone connected with the BFRO. There may have been some others that have sent me emails before, and I, it's quite possible that they're still in my inbox and I just haven't read them yet. Uh, going back to what I was saying, we live in a culture where, uh, you know, people say they hate fake news and they hate false stuff. Somebody, either the people who are critical, who have heard the Bigfoot uh, Research Organization is a crappy organization, Either they're, they're hearing something correct or someone is lying or somewhere in between. There are people out there who get on YouTube and I think they, they gather a pretty good audience and they like to use their influence to direct their audience. It's almost cult-like in some cases. I've seen, I've seen some years ago, I've seen some channels that were, they didn't have anything to do with Bigfoot, but they were, uh, they were almost cult-like, and people would believe anything these people said. You see a lot of that in politics. People are influenced greatly by what they hear. I don't know. I guess all I could say is use common sense. Use critical thinking skills if you have any. And just say, you know, just because somebody is saying that the BFRO is a bunch of uh, jerks and they kill Bigfoot and they all the things that you heard in those comments I read... Maybe it's not true. Maybe do some digging. And so with that in mind, what I'd like to do, that was my first contact with a, anybody connected in any way to the BFRO. So if anyone out there hears this podcast and they are connected, work for, or uh, are an investigator, or you're with the corporate offices, or you're with the website or even Mr. Moneymaker, 
If anybody here hears this, I would love to hear from you, and I'd be glad to talk to you in an interview. Let's get to the bottom of what the BFRO is about, and let's see if all these things people say about them are actually true. I don't mind hearing from people who have had experiences with the BFRO that are bad, and they think the BFRO is a, not a good organization. I'd like to hear from you, too. I'm not here to change anyone's mind. I'm just here because I'm curious to find out what is all this rigmarole about the uh, BFRO. I think it's fascinating. I think it's uh, it might be a study in human manipulation and thought manipulation and the power uh, that somebody has in front of a screen over, uh, over a, a lot of people's opinions of something. And then we may find out that the BFRO is a total crap organization. That may be what we find out. But I want to talk to people about it, and I'd love to dig into this and interview people and read emails and all the things that we can do to figure out really who the BFRO is and what their mission is and how good of a job they do. Right now, on the face, on the surface of it, just from this first email, it seems to me that these guys, these field investigators, do this as volunteer work. They don't get paid. So I'm thinking in my head, uh, and there's one person apparently in Idaho that covers the whole state. He said he found hundreds of reports going back 20 years that they couldn't follow up on because there was nobody there. Maybe somebody from Idaho has complained and said, well, I call the BFRO and they never got back to me. They're just a crappy organization. You know, we expect a lot of service uh, if we make a phone call, but sometimes it doesn't happen. And usually there's a reason for that. So again, I'm not taking a position either way, but I really would like to find out. So again, if you're connected with the BFRO in any way or have had a good or bad experience with the BFRO, send me an email if you're uh, up to do an interview over the uh, one thing I'm going to ask if we do an interview that you show your face, not just do the voice interview. I want you to be on there, show your face, give your name, especially if you're going to say something good or bad about the BFRO. You should be accountable and, and uh, stand up and say your name. Now, if you submit a story to me and you want to stay anonymous, I totally understand that. But we're not talking about Bigfoot encounters. We're talking about people trashing an organization that may or may not be a good organization. you got to show your face in an interview. All right, I guess that's enough. I don't know how long I've been talking here, and i got to get back on the road. So uh, let's let this end up this podcast and wind it up and we'll see you guys on the next one. And I look forward to hearing from people who are connected with the BFRO or who have had genuine experiences with the BFRO and are not just going to tell me what they heard some YouTubers say or what they heard people say in the comment section of a YouTube channel. All right. All right. We'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks.